Doug Raymond, campaign consultant, political analyst here on WPTF. Doug, by the way, will be on NC Spin this weekend. You can go ahead and check it out if you'd like at ncspin.com. They've already got the video posted there. Okay, Doug, so uh, GOP debate. Every uh, dope with the microphone or uh, a Twitter handle has uh, pretty much uh, given us their two cents. What say you? Uh, you want to you hear from this dope? Yeah, that what exactly, you're yes. <laughs> uh, I don't want to belabor this, but I think it's important we get your perspective on it because you, uh, although not at the presidential level, have certainly uh, been a campaign advisor and a campaign manager for a lot of very high-profile campaigns. So your insight, I think, would be intriguing. Well, a couple, couple things jumped out at me. Number one, those that were waiting for Trump to change his ways and mellow out uh, don't know Trump, and I do not think he did anything to really hurt himself, although he was given plenty of opportunities to do so. Um, I think uh, it really didn't separate anybody from the pack. It was great political theater. Um, I guest hosted a show this morning and I threw something out early and it seemed to resonate greatly. And this is kind of an odd take to Tim, but I, I think, you know, they do the winners and losers. I think the loser last night was Megan Kelly. I think that it's amazing. Someone, I agree with you. Wholeheartedly. Uh, I think she just came across as having an agenda. She was supposed to be there to kind of, uh, you know, guide the discussion. I think she came across as having an agenda. And, I, I don't uh, like, I think she was the big loser. I don't like slamming colleagues. And as you know, Doug, cause you've done enough in the media to, to know this. People in our business love to slam other people in our business. It's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. I, I generally don't do that. I don't like doing it. But I have always found her to be someone who just doesn't toe the line. But she crosses the line a lot, in my humble opinion. And this is not a political statement. That's just my opinion of how she conducts herself on her job. in her job. Uh, I get the fact that she's very aesthetically pleasing and is a good presenter on television. I get that. That's why she's in prime time. Will make more this year than I'll probably ever see. But I, I think I think there's a real nastiness about the way she goes about things, and I, I agree with you. I think that came out wholeheartedly last night. And the excerpts I did see, I felt like Trump did put her in her place. Well, he he did. But the big thing about Trump is is that I think. I do not think he's going to get the nomination. I think as other candidates fall to the wayside, their supporters, I do not think, are the type that would side with Trump. So they'll be building up his opponents. But I think what he's going to do is he is going to change the, the political tone. Some people said they didn't like the tone. I think the electorate likes the tone. The tone needs he, to be changed. I don't think there's – both sides are angry. I, I, I think what was telling to me last night is he admitted, I give political money to candidates – uh, to get access because I want my phone calls answered. And I think the people on stage cringed when he said it. And I think the people in the audience said, tell us something we don't know. It's no big deal. And I think his straight talk type of approach, people like the McCain straight talk, but I think he's taken it to a whole new level. And I think there's some other candidates that are going to learn from that and say, hey, I'm going to say what I think. And uh, I think people are going to respect me for it. Who were the, who were, who were the winners in your estimation from last night? Well, I, I think nobody's saying it, but I think that the expectation that Trump falling on his face didn't happen. He's a winner. I think Rubio came across. Uh, Rubio, uh, I, I think just there's something about him. He tends to be nervous to start, and we remember the response to the State of the Union address a while the back drink of water, a big yeah, problem. Yeah. Um, but once he got going, I think he was the best prepared and had some really good – uh, information and the type of lines that you were going to remember. Remember, I think he was a, a big winner. I think the one that I, I felt bad for was Ben Carson. I think the format, not giving them an opening statement, mm -hmm. really hurt Carson because people didn't get to see who he was until the end. And mm -hmm. I think he may have had the best one minute of the debate, but nobody saw it because it was his closing statement. Yeah. But uh, I, I can tell you who I think the big losers were, sure. and that was Rand Paul came across to me as a nut job. And I think Jeb Bush, who was supposed to be near the top of the polls, looked like wallpaper. And I think that was a loser for him, too. Interesting. Uh, anybody from that uh, pregame meal uh, debate that went on in, in the middle of the afternoon? Well, I, I, it kind of made me feel good because I've been talking for months that, you know, I just do not understand the lack of attention to Carly Farino. I mean, she's got a great resume. She's articulate. And the big thing is, if we're going to make the presumption, which I hate to do, but everybody else seems to be doing it, that it's going to be Hillary Clinton on the other side, 
who better to go out up after except a, another woman and for some reason she's never gotten attention but she definitely was the cream of the crop in that debate yeah. and i would guess the next time around she's going to be with the a team and we'll see how she performs then doug raymond is uh, alongside here as we uh, talk to him uh political analyst uh, for us here on wptf busy busy second half of the week uh, down at the general assembly building Absolutely. A big day over there and, and lots was coming out. And, and uh, you mentioned I'm on NC Spin this week. We were filming and my phone was just blowing up on the way over to the studios with the stuff going on. And it was a busy day. And I, I think I know, Patrick, you always like to hear about what is considered maybe underreported stories. Mm -hmm. I think the underreported story this week is there's been a lot of t attention about the House passing what is basically referred to as their capital improvements or transportation bond proposal uh, that the governor has been pushing so hard. But the big news to me was is they voted to have that bond not on the upcoming November ballot, but on the standalone presidential primary ballot, which we believe will be March 15th. Uh, that's that's going to make it a much harder bond to pass than it would have been uh, on the November ballot. That is very, very big news, and I'm not sure uh, folks have caught it. Why do you think it will be harder to pass for that primary? Well, or you on remember the, the reason ballot. that the primary date has been moved up is they want North Carolina to be more relevant, especially in the Republican primary. We are going to be very relevant. It will be huge um, voter turnout. Now, a lot of times they say, well, the bigger the voter turnout, uh, the, the more likely for something like that uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to pass. I think it's going to be a very Republican-leading primary. I think all the action is going to be, I think Republicans are going to come out in droves, and I think those would be the ones who would vote against the bonds. So I think they're going to have a little bit more trouble. Who stuck that in there, do we know? Um, sorry, I can't remember his name, but it was a conservative, uh, house member okay. and it was, it was very last, I had heard a rumbling about it, but it was very, very, uh, last minute. And I'm really surprised from the governor's office on down that there hasn't been more of an outcry. So Doug, we've, this, this will go on to the Senate, but Phil Berger taking some provisions out this week, are you going to consider them separately in order to kind of move this budget process along? It looks like that's where they're going. I found it interesting that, uh, Senator Berger, President Berger, uh, along with uh, Speaker Moore and Governor McCory, were all breaking bread yesterday uh, morning. Uh, they were on our friend Henry Henton's uh, stations, our cousin stations down there, WTIB and WNBU, as he did his show from uh, the legislature yesterday, his morning program. And I found it really interesting, Doug, that uh, the Berger and Moore sitting beside one another with with Henry in between them. Uh, from some of the pictures I saw discussing, uh, it really wasn't point-counterpoint, but having a pretty open discussion, they, they seem to indicate that they're not as far apart on the budget as, as maybe is being reported. Is, but that's only the case now because the Medicaid and, and the other things have been taken out, right? Well, yes, but I'm going to, you know, just sometimes, uh, you know, in the business, we hear stuff and we're kind of at liberty just to make vague references. Right. And that's about it. I'm going to tell you exactly what has happened here. The Senate got frustrated uh, with the lack of communication from the House. And when they sat down and talked about it, they said, we think it's generating from one place. And that's Nelson Dollar. They, they said they weren't going on with the budget unless Medicaid got taken care of. Nelson Dollar was driving the Medicaid bus, but he was basically refusing to talk about it. And they decided, they went to, to uh, Speaker Moore and said, listen, let's go around them. And that's basically what's happened. I mean, they, they've gone around Nelson Dollar and said, we can do this without you. And uh, we have said all along, once Medicaid uh, gets on the table, everything else will fall into place. And that appears to be what's happening. So it's been a drastic shift, but th that's exactly what happened. They've decided to go around Nelson Dollar. I don't want to lose time here. So, and we've got a little over a minute. Aldana Vosh uh, leaving this week, uh, DHH, DHH. S, uh, secretary. We don't need to go into her tenure. We don't have time to do that. But she leaves uh, the week before. Suddenly, uh, the uh, Tony Taylor leaves Department of Transportation. If the governor knew this was coming uh, two months ago with with uh, with Secretary Vosch, why not maybe hold it off? Because it does give that perception that people are jumping ship. Well, I don't think. Uh, I, I think. Tata, what a difference a week makes. You know, Tata's gone in the almost the dark at night, office cleaned out. Uh, he's done. 
Uh, she gets the order of the longleaf pine. The governor cries. She's going to stay on and help with the transition. Um, I think this was coming, but I, I'm just going to be a little bit cynical. I think a big part of this was the fundraising number. And I, I think Aldona Voss was one of the governor's uh, biggest fundraisers. And I think uh, he feel, you know, I think they both felt mutually. She can't raise money when she does this. This was not a long-term thing. She wouldn't have taken a dollar a year to do it if it was long-term. Right. And, uh, I think they just said, let's go ahead and get this over with and, and move on. And I, I know they had the replacement that they felt comfortable with in place. And they said, why wait? And I think you're going to, if you're a Republican donor, uh, you're going to be hearing from uh, Aldona very soon, I have a feeling. Interesting. Very interesting. Doug Raymond with us here. Doug, always great to speak to you. Thank you for your insight. Uh, thank you. It's always good to be with you, Patrick.